Revelations 22, verses 6 to 14. Then he said to me, These words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angels to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then he said to me, See that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant and of your brethren the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book, worship God. And he said to me, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. Who is as holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. Amen. The message this morning is about God's book of life. We've all heard of it, um, but I didn't really understand it. So... It's actually mentioned in Exodus and David's Psalms and uh, Daniel, Malachi, Luke, Philipp Philippians, Hebrews and Revelation. Uh, in King David's Psalm 139, this is what he says. He's speaking to God. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance and in your book were all written the days that were appointed for me, when as yet there was not one of them. From what David has written, we can understand the following. Before we are born, God has claimed us as his own by writing our names in his book of life. And he also writes the exact number of our days, so he knows the day that we will go home to heaven. And then also in Psalm 56, he says, You have taken account of my wanderings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not recorded in your book? And so we see that God is with us every day in every moment of our lives. And he records everything that happens to us as we go through our life. He knows everything. So if you don't get sympathy, as you feel you should, as we do in situations and things we go through, if you feel alone, you are not alone. God knows everything, and he is with you. And all you need is to turn to him, and he'll be there as your comforter. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 25, and this is Jesus' parable of the wise and foolish virgins. This is about being ready for heaven when our time comes. The bridegroom, of course, is Jesus. And as we all know, the Bible tells us to be ready. So in this parable, Jesus is delayed. The bridegroom is delayed. And so the bridesmaids, or the uh, wise and foolish virgins, are waiting. And these virgins represent us. We are the virgins the Christians. And they're all waiting and they begin to fall asleep, as we all do when we have to wait for a long time. But then suddenly at midnight, a time when most people are asleep, there is a shout. The bridegroom is coming. Go out and meet him. 
Then all the virgins got up to light their lamps. But the foolish virgins exclaimed, Our lamps are going out. Give us some of your oil. But the wise reply, Go and buy oil for yourselves. Now that seems a bit mean, doesn't it? When you are there with another sister, she doesn't have enough oil, wouldn't you think it would be simple enough just to lend her some oil? But this is referring to the fact that we must all face judgment alone. No one can stand in for someone else. It's our own journey. The bridegroom finally arrives, but only those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and then the door was shut and locked. When the others returned, they knocked and said, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But it was too late, and he replied, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, I do not know you, which means we have no relationship. Recently I attended a funeral and it, um, it was a Christian funeral and the reading for the funeral, which is a very common one, was John 14, 1 to 6. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said, the famous doubter, said, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So we've got this mentioning before, I don't know you. And then Jesus says again, no one comes to the Father except through me. So then the minister carried on at the funeral, and this is what he said. As we gather to celebrate the life of your loved one who has passed away, the reading today assures us that he lives on in God's house of many rooms, with all his loved ones, his ancestors who have gone before him. Now that was very comforting. I was um, sitting there thinking, this is wonderful. Here's another good Christian who has gone home to live with the Lord. And then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit filled me with grief, a terrible grief. And I couldn't understand why I was grieving. And then I heard the words, I never knew him. And I knew God was telling me he didn't make it. Even though everyone at that service thought he was a good Christian man, he never had a relationship with God, with Jesus, with Jesus Christ. And therefore, the Lord had to shut and lock the door. In Philippians, Paul is writing to the church in Philippi about two women who have come to his attention. These women are having great trouble working together. Right? <laughs> they don't like each other. But they're working in the house of God. So Paul says, I implore you, O Dila, and Sintashi, I'm glad those names never caught on from the Bible, to agree and to work in harmony with the Lord. Indeed, I urge you too, my true companion, and he's talking to Timothy, to help these women 
to keep cooperating, for they have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Paul is worried that because of their constant quarrelling, these women will cancel out the good things that have been written about them in God's book of life. In the book of Malachi, it's in chapter 3, it talks about God's book of life is referred to as the book of remembrance. Then those who feared the Lord with all filled reverence spoke to one another, and the Lord paid attention and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who fear the Lord with an attitude of reverence and respect and who esteem his name. They will be mine, says the Lord of hosts. On that day when I publicly recognise them and openly declare them to be my own possession, that is my very special treasure, and I will have compassion on them and spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you will again distinguish between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. And that's a comparison with the one who serves God is the one who has relationship with God. And the one who doesn't serve him is the one who does not have relationship with God. This book of life is God's record of our journey. He records all our successes. But what God sees as our success is perhaps not what we would think. Our greatest success is being able to surrender our lives to God's will without knowing what that will look like. That's pretty hard to do. It's being able to lay everything at his feet. Our failures, our pain, our guilt, and our regrets. Along with our dreams, our success, and everything we have. To have the ability to seek his heart and ask him to change us into what he needs us to be for him, that is our greatest success. Now also in Matthew 25 we have the famous parable of the talents. Now, originally, talents were gold or silver coins, and each talent was worth more than a labourer in those days could earn in 20 years of employment. So basically, a working lifetime was the worth of a talent. Eventually, this is where the English word talent came from which is describing gifts and special skills or abilities. Through his book of life, God makes talents available to us to use in his will. While we're here on this earth, every one of us has God-given talents. Just as the man in this parable is entrusting his possessions to his servants, so too God entrusts us with the talents he has given us. The man, as you know, the parable goes, the man called his servants together and entrusted them with his possessions. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability. And then he went on his journey. Both the servants who had been entrusted with the most talents traded them and made a profit. But the one who had only one went and dug a hole and buried it. 
After a long time, the master returned to settle his accounts. So, of course, we all understand from this parable that the master is God and the servants are us. Okay, so both the servant who had received the five talents and the servant who had received the two talents came and said, Master, you entrusted to me these talents. See, I've made a profit and gave even, gained even more talents. And their master said to them, and you hear this a lot at funerals, well done, good and faithful servants. You have been faithful and trustworthy over a little. And so I will put you both in charge of many things. Share in the joy with your master. The one who had received one talent also came forward and said, Master, I knew you to be a harsh and demanding man, reaping the harvest where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So basically that means this third servant thought of his master as being a shrewd and ruthless businessman who grows rich off the backs of others. So he didn't have a very good attitude. And he said, so I was afraid to lose the talent. So I went and hid your talent in the ground. Never used it, wasted it. But his master answered him, you're an untrustworthy and lazy servant. You ought to have least put my money with the bankers and on my return, I would have received my money back with interest. And then Jesus goes on to say, the worthless servant will be thrown out into the outer darkness, in that place of grief and torment, where there will be weeping through sorrow and pain, and grinding of teeth through distress and anger. For everyone who has blessings and gifts from God, they also have a responsibility to use those blessings and gifts wisely, this is scripture, in obedience to God and for the glory of his kingdom. To those whose blessings and gifts are valued and used wisely, more will be given. And they will be richly supplied so that there will always be an abundance. But the one who does not have, because he has ignored or disregarded his blessings and gifts from God, what he does have will be taken away. So you, if you don't use it, you lose it. We learn of the joyous results of those whom Jesus sent out. This is the 70. This is after Pentecost. No, it's not after Pentecost. It's before Jesus passed away, before Jesus died on the cross. They were sent out two by two, and there were 70. And it's in Luke chapter 10. The 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Jesus said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. Listen carefully, says Jesus. I have given you authority. That means you possess it now. To tread on serpents and scorpions. And the ability to exercise your authority in my name, over all the power of the enemy, which is Satan. And nothing will in any way harm you. And this last sentence is what Jesus wants us to understand the most. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this that the spirits are subject to you. 
but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. Okay. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, every Christian who becomes a Christian seeks eternal life. And God seeks every person to be with him for eternity. It's just that it's difficult for the message to go and join the two together. Everything is in your word, Lord. But so many people do not read a lot of the Bible. I think in the world today, out of all the Christians in the world, there's only a very small percent that read the Bible. Maybe, I don't know, 10%. I would, yeah. But still, it's sometimes difficult to understand the Bible. Even when we read it, we think, what, what does that mean? And that's why we need your Holy Spirit, so that your Holy Spirit can reveal things to us. Relationship with you, Lord, is the most important thing. That is why you died on the cross for us, so that we could have relationship with you and know you, believe in you, follow you, trust you, but mostly believe the words that you wrote for us to hear, which are in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are your words to us. So if we don't read anything else, we should read the Gospels. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will be released, that there will be a great outpouring of your Spirit, Lord, so that people will know you, know that you are real, know that your power is something that can change everything. Your power can raise the dead. Your power will defeat Satan. We must keep our eyes on Jesus. We must open our hearts to the word of God. We must look for you. <coughs> look for you, seek you. And when we find you, follow you with all our hearts. Lord, help us to know and understand how much you love us how much you know us, how much you're with us every day in everything we go through, in everything we are trying to work out, we're trying to understand, we're trying to resolve. There are a lot of motion, emotions that we go through in every day. People say things to us that upset us. We get bad news. We hear bad news of loved ones. Help us to know that we can go straight to you, Lord, and that you have the power to do anything. And help us to understand that, Lord, that you are our rock, you are our salvation, you are our king, and you love us and want us to walk into everything you have for us. And you have a new life for us, a new beginning, and you have an amazing end for us, Lord, with you. 
please help us to understand that we need to make sure that we are going to receive you at that wedding feast door, that it will not be locked, that we will be welcomed with open arms to your table. Thank you, Jesus, for being with us here today. And I pray that he goes with you now and stays with you every day. <laughs>